The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, Jesus began to say in the synagogue, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here also in your own country. And he said to them, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when there came a great famine over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and put him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, so that they might throw him down headlong. But passing through the midst of them, he went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Question number one. Who is a prophet in the biblical sense? Who is a prophet in the biblical tradition? And what is the true role of the prophet as reflected in today's readings? What is the true role of the prophet as reflected in today's readings? Question two, what prompted St. Paul to admonish the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12, 31 to, quote, to earnestly desire the higher gifts? What prompted St. Paul to tell them this? And what are these higher gifts? Question three, why did the people of Nazareth who admired him as he spoke and wondered how he got all this wisdom. Who admired the wonderful things he did in Capernaum and elsewhere. Why did they suddenly turn against Jesus? And in our own case, how do we sometimes reject the prophets of our own time? Question four. At baptism, each one of you and myself, you are all anointed priest, prophet, and king. In what ways are you being called today to play the role of a prophet in your society? Yes, Mike. I want to attempt question number one. Okay. Who is the prophet in the biblical tradition? The prophet in the biblical tradition is he who God has called to proclaim his word to the people, to speak the truth of God to the people. Can we say that together? The one whom God has called... The one whom God has called to proclaim his truth 
to proclaim his truth to the people to the people actually you need to emphasize to speak for god can you say that together to speak for god we, i shall be explaining that is actually the etymology of the greek word uh, prophetess the hebrew word nebi you have the arabic word nebi right the hebrew version is nabi nabi and the greek version is prophetess what it means is to speak for god to speak on behalf of god, god. to go before god to speak see that's how it's explained. To go before God to speak. To speak on behalf of God. To speak for God. Three different interpretations that come together to, to, be, to mean prophet. Yes. Yeah, it's also, the, also referred to as the oracle of God. Now, the oracle of God. The oracle of God. It's the mouthpiece of God who okay. speaks and proclaims the word of God to the people. Now, okay. In our present day society, we often refer to the prophet as a, a soothsayer or the, somebody who foretells the future. That has nothing to do with prophecy. The true prophet is the man who proclaims the, the truth, truth of God, the word of God. of God, who is the oracle of God and speaks the word of God. And the second part of the question says, and what is the true role of the prophet as reflected in today's readings? In today's readings, in actual fact, we have a classical role taught us by five different prophets as mentioned in the scriptures today. Five? Five. Uh -huh. Who? We have Jeremiah. The first reading, the yes. The first reading, the prophets. And in the gospel, we have, of course, before the true prophet himself, we had mentioned to us Elijah and Elisha. Oh, okay. And the then, of course, we have Jesus Christ himself who is the true oracle of God. But hidden in those readings also is a prophet that was not mentioned. And that prophet was the young Jewish girl who was taken to slavery in Syria and who proclaimed the word of God to Naaman that made Naaman to go and find cure in Elisha. This is good for affirmative action for women, isn't it? It is good for affirmative action for women. That yes, they were mentioning Elisha who healed Naaman, but somebody did the groundwork. Somebody did the evangelization that proclaimed the prophet of Israel to the Syrian. And that girl is the slave girl. The slave unnamed. Girl. Now, the prophet's role today, as it was yesterday, is to speak out the word of God, against the decadence in religion, against the decadence in government, against the decadence in our personal lives as prophets, kings, and priests. So if we who are baptized prophets, priests, and kings, if we start becoming decadent, then we need an external prophet to harass us, isn't yes, it? To remind us about the word of God and to point out the way of God to us and the truth of God to us. And of course, it comes with challenges, as we saw in the life of Jeremiah, as we saw in the life of Jesus Christ himself, who had to face a lot of things. But that does not excuse the prophet from playing his role. As God warned Jeremiah, say, don't be dismayed at them, or I will dismay you. Go out and say the word. Don't be afraid. I am with you, and I will be with you to defend you. What if he gets killed at the age of 25, 30? That is the role God has called him to do, and he's fulfilled his role. Doesn't so really what matter. becomes of his own uh, life now? His life is hidden in Christ. His life is hidden in God. You know, I keep saying that if you look at Christianity from this worldly perspective, you can't understand it. It is difficult to understand Christianity if you look at it only from this worldly perspective. I mean, if somebody says he's doing the will of God and speaking for God and dies in the prime of life at the age of 30, in the eyes of the world and of the African traditional religion, that's a wasted life, isn't it? That life was thrown away. Once you go beyond this world, then it makes sense. But if you remain within the ambience of this world, it does not make sense. Give him a round of applause.
Yes, Solomon. I'll attempt question number four. Yes. Which, of course, is closely linked to question number one. I am called by baptism to be a prophet. And my role as a prophet is to speak the truth according to the word of God. Is to speak the truth according to the word of God. The, the word of God is true. Is to speak the word of God, which is truth. That's, yes. that's, that's like tautology now. Eh? It's to speak the truth. Correct. Or to speak the word of God or because the, the word, word of God, God is true. It's to speak the truth. And of course, in speaking that truth, there are consequences. You know that. Very well, Father. Okay. They will suffer rejection because truth itself is bitter. And so most often when you speak the truth, you are bound to suffer rejection. You won't have the, the acceptance that is required. And so as a prophet, not minding the odds, not minding the inherent dangers, I am called to speak the truth at all times, an emphasis on at all times, not minding the risk involved. Just as uh, Prophet Jeremiah was called by God, and in the face of all the dangers, the rejection, the threat by the kings, the princes, he went out and spoke the truth to the people. Wait a minute, you, you are a lawyer, Abby? Yes, Father. You are a law teacher? Yes, Father. Will you make a lot of money so if you, if you are going along this path? Well, without humility, Father, my answer to this is that I have been, you have? I have taught law for over 10 years now in the university, and I have stuck to my principle of not sorting, not involving anything that has to do with um, settlement for grades. And so I have seen, with due respect, to my, I have seen my colleagues who, who do such things. Such things. And I, it takes you know, a conviction to be firm to those principles, to remain. You mean this thing they call sorting actually happens? It does exist. Clearly, it exists. It I, happens. I'm speaking from experience. I'm and you, you know about it? Very well. What have you done about it? Is, what, is, it, what, enough, is it enough not to, not to be sorted? Follow for, the instructions. For a few of us, we try as much as possible to speak against it. Because part of the thing is not just knowing the truth, but speaking the truth and acting out the truth. And so few of us take it upon ourselves to speak the truth that these things are not actually good. But of course, the overwhelming majority stick to it and say, what a man go do? So that is the challenge. We try by our action, by our conduct, by whenever we're in a forum, we say that these things are not actually good. Hey, yes. Chichi, did you people have certain in Dublin? You don't know, if you go to Trinity College in Dublin and you talk about sorting, they don't know about it. Hey, yeah. Where did we manufacture sorting from? Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Yes, Victor. Father, I'd like to attempt question three. Yes. I believe the reason the Nazareth, people of Nazareth rejected um, Jesus um, was because he did not conform to their standards and expectations. He did not conform to their expectations, such as? Now, they believe that he has done so many miracles <coughs> outside Israel. If he was not going to do more for them, as, a, as we say, son of the soil, the least he could do is just to, he has done outside Israel. And Christ is telling them that I'm not going to do that. And backs it up, the scripture, telling them how there were many widows in Israel, lepers and so on. And yet, they were not used by God. Today, the prophets of today, we also reject. 
And um, I'd like to look at even an example from this church. We them for similar reasons, where they don't conform to our expectations, what they say. And um, talking about our church, I don't know exactly whether I would describe some of your homilies as prophetic. But I like to look at the one that became very controversial when you talked about inheritance, advising parents that they should just equip their children, train them. Because when you leave a lot of inheritance for them, you are perhaps inadvertently altifying their God-given talents. That's not what a lot of people wanted to hear. And that was why it attracted quite a number of, um, should I say, rejections. The internet was abuzz with all kinds of... Uh, because that's not what the people wanted to hear. What they wanted to hear was different. For you to encourage people to um, leave inheritance for their children and so on. And they quoted, uh, I think, proverbs or so to support it. So generally, the point there is this passage goes again to reinforce that very strong biblical injunction that his ways are not our ways. His ways are not our ways. Give him a round of applause. Yes, Emmanuel. Please permit me to attempt question two. What prompted St. Paul to admonish the Corinthians to earnestly desire the higher gifts? Father, at that time, the people and the audience that St. Paul was addressing were mainly looking for external things like knowledge, prophecy, like things, wealth, things, external things that people look for, things like prestige, some external things that people glorify themselves that people look for. And the people, mainly the Corinthians at that time, were people who were, um, who you would think that are very knowledgeable academicians, look for all of those things. But Paul, in addressing them, saying that you should not look for these external things that glorify this knowledge, miracles, speaking in tongues, and all of those things. But you should look for the higher things that goes beyond all of these externalities. And going back to the second part of the question, what are those, these external gifts that Paul was talking to them about? Those external gifts that Paul was talking about were gifts, higher values like love, compassion, kindness, being kind to people around you, and faith in God, and trust in God. These were the things that Paul were looking, was addressing them to look for these higher values in the community and among the people. Emmanuel, you used to get 80, 90 percent. Today it's like uh, 60, 65. Eh? What happened? You are on the right track, but to be more specific, um, the letters of St. Paul are responses to questions from the, those communities. As you know, St. Paul goes to evangelize a place and he communicates with them by mail, by letters. And when he, they are responding to him, they tell him what issues are going on in the community. Particularly, Emmanuel, he was responding to their fascination with speaking in tongues. It's called glossolalia. It's fascinating, isn't it? It's fascinating when people, when people blare in tongues. Everybody was fascinated by it and they all wanted to be able to speak in tongues but they were not seeking the gift of love, of higher faith, of teaching. You see, 
St. Paul went ahead to list the gifts in hierarchy, in the order of importance. And speaking in tongues came last in his listing. Do you understand? But that is the one the people wanted the most. That is the highest for people. Because human, human beings have a fascination for wonder, wonder. And St. Paul taught people that, look, it's neither here nor there. Yeah, you can pray in tongues, you can speak in tongues, but that is not one of, and it doesn't show any, any holiness. What will show holiness is the love that ushers from your heart. The, if you have the gift of love. Next, when it comes to functions in church, if you have the gift of teaching, teaching the faith is a higher, much higher gift. If you have the gift of um, compassion, as he mentioned. So Paul was responding to a specific uh, controversy in the community about the fact that, look, me, I speak in tongues, so I am a better Christian than you. That was a kind of controversy. Me, I speak in tongues. You, you can't speak in tongues. And Paul was saying, what's all this nonsense? Seek the higher gifts. Seek the higher gifts that will build up the community. That is where he now said, of what use is it for somebody to be prophesying in tongues and there's nobody in that community who can interpret it? Have you read that? Of what use is it? Now, by the way, I hope you all know that there are two people just talk about speaking in tongues. There is speaking in tongues, which is actually prophesying, and there is praying in tongues. There are two different things. So what we have just said about prophecy, about speaking for God, about oracle, it can come in form of tongue, strange tongue. But in that community, in that gathering, there must be somebody who can interpret it. If there's no one who can interpret it, it's useless, absolutely of no use. Then there is praying in tongues by which somebody has the gift of going in tongues not to show off but to avoid distraction. Now, the drama that I see all over the place, where I can come and say, oh yeah, all of us, let's begin to speak in tongues. One, two, go. It's an abuse. It's an abuse. That's not the speaking in tongues we see in the scriptures. So, Paul was saying, listen, if, you know, you remember, you can link this up with what he said about the cross. If I want to boast, I will boast in the cross. So seek higher gifts. The gift of long suffering is a higher gift than the gift of tongues. The kind of long suffering you people say, God forbid. Eh? The gift of long suffering. I hope you know long suffering is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the gift of long suffering, meaning of endurance. I'm told that people don't want to bear the name patience. The gift of patience. Now, those are higher gifts than simply speaking in tongues. Actually, when God gives gifts, he gives them for the benefit of the community. Now, why speaking in tongues is a lower gift is that if he gives you the gift of teaching, it is meant for the benefit. Is it for your benefit? To benefit others. If he gives you the gift of prophecy, it is to benefit others. But if he gives you the gift of praying in tongues, it is your own. It is for you to help you in your spiritual, building your spiritual life. That's not for benefit others. Do you understand? So the higher gifts are the gifts that honor God and benefit other people. Give me a round of applause. The burden of a prophet. In the biblical sense, we go back to what um, uh, Mike said. In the biblical sense, the prophet, Nabi in Hebrew, Anabi in, Hebrew, in uh, Arabic, prophetess in Greek, is not one who predicts the future. So the one who comes and says, open your palm to me and read your palm and tells you what is going to happen to you next tomorrow. We may call, people may call that prophet, but that's not the prophet in a biblical 
sense. Do you understand? Now, the one who opens your palm and, and leads it to you to tell you what will happen is likened to the clairvoyance. Likened to the witch of Enzo that Saul went to see. Do you understand? It is likened to occultism. It's close to occultism. I keep telling people that anyone who is desiring the gift of vision, be very careful. Anyone who is desiring vision, be very careful because the devil is close by. Vision. The point is that what the Lord wants us to do is to trust completely in him. By the time you start probing what is about to happen to me next tomorrow, next year, it compromises your calling to place your trust on the Lord. Do you get the point? So be careful when you are seeking for some human power to tell you what will happen. What you should be doing is to tell God to guide your steps. So that even when you meet obstacles, that the Lord will give you the graces you need to overcome the obstacles. Guide my steps. On a daily basis, you wake up, you kneel down, you ask the Lord to guide you. You are going to bed, you say, into your hands I commend my spirit. What else are you looking for? If you go looking for somebody that will tell you that then you are being tempted like Saul. King Saul was tempted and he ended up with the witch, the winch of Enzor. The prophet is one who speaks for God. Prophet Tess. He is one who is called and commissioned by God to speak the truth and declare the plan of God to the people. The prophet is one called to stand in church, as I am standing, to go to the town square. If our politicians here, if they win, then they stand in the Senate, they stand in the House of Rep, they stand in the council, Amak council, then to use the mass media, Inya is there. To use the social media. Who is social media celebrity here? Uh, only Inya. Okay. Huh? Grace. Oh, she's a social media celebrity. Okay. Uh, how many followers do you have? Uh, how many followers? One million? Do you have, do you have 10,000? Okay. You mean I have more than you? To use the social media, many of us are on social media now. Many people here are on social media. But are you using it to speak for God? I mean, you know how to forward all kinds of useless things. But do you use it to speak for God? To use your, the position, your position in government. To use your position in parliament. To use your position in the corporate boardroom. To say the truth of God to the people. That's a prophet. Do you understand? Do I say it again? The prophet is one who is called. Like I said, you and I are baptized. Therefore, we are called, we are anointed priests, kings, and prophets. So, whether you are standing in church, or you are in the town square, or you, use, you are on media, mass media, social media, to use your position in government office, to use your position in the school, in the university, in parliament or in corporate boardroom to say the truth of God. So you are a teacher in the university, in the Nigerian university system where there is the anomaly called sorting. It is not enough that you are not sorted. You should do more than that. You should do what? You should stop the people sorting. Tell them the truth of God. You know, I'm told that in this sorting business, the one that is really benefiting more than any other person is a class rep. Have you, have you heard that before? Class rep. The student that is the class rep. I'm told that he is the one that actually is sorted the more because the class rep organizes the sorting. So the teacher and the student, they don't, they don't meet. 
It is the classmate rep you go to meet who helps you to negotiate and put some of it in his. It's a rotten system, so it's rotten all the, all the way. So if the class rep says that the Oka wants 10,000 naira, the class rep can deliver 5,000 naira. You don't know, the teacher doesn't know. So, and if he does that for 30 people, can you see that he's the one who has been sorted the most? So the class rep is like a contractor. He's a contractor that sorts, that sorts the teacher on your behalf and then um, sorts himself in the process. Prophets are servants of the word of God. Now, that means what I have just said about sorting. That means that the student in the school who is a baptized person, who is a prophet, the average student also has work to do, isn't it? It means it is not just the teacher who has work to do among his colleagues. The students have work to do among their colleagues. It is uh, Femi Falana who was telling us at our last public forum that his son did not, there was an exam, his son did not pass well or something, and then he was going to take it again. And there was this teacher whom they employed to give him extra coaching. And the teacher decided to be of help. To be of help and help his son to pass through some form of sorting. And his son said, no. What you are supposed to do for me is to teach me so that I may pass the exam myself, not for you to help me. And Femi Falana said, at the end of the day, he now took up the teacher as a corrupt person and um, almost prosecuted that teacher for tempting his son. Reason is that he said, from childhood, he has been training his son in integrity. And now, at Waek or Jam, this teacher wanted to tempt his son. And I think Joe, I came over here, also told a story of his daughter or son at exam, where the teacher wanted to help. And the student was so flabbergasted. What, what are you talking about? Because the child has been trained from childhood that your mark, the mark you deserve, is the work you did, not what somebody does for you, not what they call help. So actually, sometimes, under those kind of circumstances, the young person in the university, many people in the university are up to 18, right? The young person in the university has work to do as a prophet too, right? You are not just passive. We have something to do. We cannot just be talking about the teachers. The young person too. Because from childhood you are supposed to have learned what integrity is all about. So prophets are the servants of the word of God. While living in the material world, in this world beneath the sky, prophets are very sensitive to the spiritual realm. You see, prophets are sustained by a vision of life beyond this world. Prophets will eat food with you in the buka, will go to the motor park with you, will enter keked in a pep with you, but prophets live beyond the mundane. They have a connection beyond the ordinary. Prophets have a critical relationship with the future. Now, this is where the future comes in. Those of you who talk about, you know, predicting the future. Prophets have a critical relationship with the future. How? Because the truth of God which they speak today naturally illuminates the future. The truth of God God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the, the truth of God that the prophet speaks today illuminates naturally, illuminates the future. 
living out the truth of God today or rejecting the truth of God today will inevitably affect future turn of events. Do you, you get that? How we live out the truth or live out our lie. I mean, Nigeria, for example, we have been living a lie. And that is why the lie we lived 20 years ago is what we are suffering now, true or false. And if we continue to live a lie, if we continue to model things up and sort, if we sort people and then we sort people to, to graduate as a, as a doctor, sorted doctor, now, what happens in future? If in 25 years' time, the person is operating you and he doesn't know what to do and kills you, so the truth of today affects what happens tomorrow. Can you understand? So what the prophet says, for example, is, I have used this expression many times, if you do not change your course, you will end up where you are headed. That's what the prophet says. The prophet says, repent, because if you do not repent, you are going to crash. Look at where you are facing. You are facing the wrong direction. If you do not change, the direction you are facing is not going to lead you home. It's going to lead to destruction. If you end up in destruction, is it just um, predicting the future? It's more than that. It's telling you the truth of today that can affect the well-being of tomorrow. Because they are in close contact with God. Prophets are called not only to speak the truth, the word of God, but also to live out God's mercy and compassion. Part of the word of God is that he is the friend of the poor, the father of orphans, uh, defender of the widow. He is the friend of the, he is the one that is merciful and compassionate, abundant in mercy and compassion. He is the, the truth of God is that where God is, there there is peace, isn't it? Jesus says, I leave you peace. The peace the world cannot give is my gift to you. That's part of the word of God, right? I have come that they may have a life and have it more abundantly. That's part of the truth of God. That if the Lord is present, there is peace. The other day we sang, great things happen when God visits. So, and woman too. So, where God visits, that's part of the truth of God. Great things happen. So, the prophet speaks the word. That word is often joy for the brokenhearted. That word of the prophet uh, how do we put it? The word of the prophet convicts the conceited and comforts the afflicted. The word of God convicts the conceited and afflicts the comforted. It comforts the afflicted and convicts the conceited. Meaning that those who think they have it, those who are sustaining the status quo and are happy with the rotten situation in our society, the word of God, the prophet, the word of the prophet should convict them. Now, those who are suffering on account of the status quo, the same word of God comforts them. Do you, can you see the word of God being a double-edged sword now? That's what they mean by the word of God. St. Paul says it's a double-edged sword. It is the same word that brings comfort to the afflicted. It is the same word that brings conviction to the conceited. That's why the same prophet, the same prophet that declared woe for the evildoer is the same one who says in chapter 40 of Isaiah, console my people, console them. So, prophets hate sin. Prophets hate injustice and immorality. Prophets live lives of simplicity and frugality. I mean, when somebody comes with five bouncers and he comes in a pilot vehicle and a retinue of staff and so on and he calls himself a prophet. Now, why are you a prophet? No be better prophet, no be a prophet. No, the first, the first element of the prophetic life is frugality, right? 
the first element of the prophetic life is what? Frugality. Simplicity. Purity. So, when, when people go around, was telling us the story of I think it is uh, Chidi Odinkalo who was telling us in, a, in an interview of, of seeing a motorcade that nearly pushed him off the road. And when he staggered to a halt and he looked, they said it was a man of God. It was a prophet, a la Nigeria, Nigerian style prophet. But no, the prophet lives a life of simplicity and frugality. Prophets are often willing to stand alone and to suffer for righteousness sake. Prophets know how to run to God, how to pray when things go wrong. Now, listen, as I'm talking of prophet, don't think of somebody far away. I'm saying you are called to be aha. So when I'm talking of frugality, when I'm talking of simplicity, you think I'm talking of some people coming from where? From Capernaum. I'm talking of people like me and you because by baptism we are anointed prophets. Why is frugality so important? Because the more we allow the appetites of the flesh to consume us, the less the spirit grows. The human appetite, the appetite for power, the appetite for profit, the appetite for pleasure, the appetite for popularity, the more you allow it to grow, the more stunted your soul will be. It is not me who is saying it. That is the truth of nature. Let me tell your neighbor. Let me tell your neighbor. The more you allow the appetites of the flesh to soar, the more stunted your spirit will be. It is not Father George who is saying it. Say, tell your neighbor. It is the truth of nature. See, it, this is why frugality is so important for anyone who will serve the Lord. Why do you, th have that, has any of you ever sat down to ask yourself, why is it that fasting is such a critical ingredient for all religious people? Why do you think fasting is so important? Fasting is so important because fasting is the symbol of that frugality. That, that you have food. It's not that you are, you are poor and you can't afford food. That there is food there and that you tell yourself, I will not eat. Not now. I told you the story before. I told you the story of some monks in some country in Europe who used to eat once a day at 11 o'clock. One, one meal in 24 hours. They are not fasting. That's the normal. If they are fasting, it means they will drop that one meal. But one meal in, tw in 24 hours. They eat at 11 o'clock. The average age of the, of the monks is 90. Uh -huh, meaning that there are those over 100. Discipline. Discipline. And today there is a new research that is out about the fact that you want to live long, eat small. Uh, you want to live long, go and, I mean, I'm giving you free medical advice. <laughs> you want to live long, go and start eating half of what you ate up to yesterday. Start eating half of it and you can elongate your life. Now, what does that say? If this is true on the biological level, you think it's not true on the social level? I'm saying social. Don't you think if it is true on the biological level, don't you think it's true on the social level? Don't you think it is true on the level of... Uh, um, uh, how we conduct our lives in society, what you acquire, economic level, don't you think it's true? It's true in every way. It's true on the spiritual level. The more your human appetite soar, the more your spirit is stunted. That is the truth. 
Those who do not care whether their spirits are stunted, then they can expand in this world as much as possible. Those who don't care whether their spirit is stunted. But those who care, you can't have the two together. Eh? Once again, Anibira Corona Roya or Pitan. You can't have the two together. Meaning, something has to give. Something has to give. If you must be very popular in the world and seek popularity. Certain things on the spiritual level will suffer. Just tell yourself, what is of ultimate concern for you? Yesterday I was watching a documentary on William Shakespeare. And the documentary on William Shakespeare, a new movie is out on William Shakespeare, his life. I was watching the documentary and he said that because he was in London doing this wonderful, writing this place and acting this place and so on, he had no time for a family. And towards the end of his life, he was a bit depressed because he had neglected his family. You can't have the two now. Do you understand? He chose to be such a phenomenal person in literature, in drama, and so on. He couldn't have a vibrant family life. It's not so easy what they say, work-life balance. It's not such an easy thing. In the same way, you can't have it full. So they bring the latest cars. You are interested. The latest uh, uh, perfume, that's the one you want. The latest this, that's the one you want. You must consume the latest gadgets and the latest things. Then you are also very, you want to be very high on the spiritual level. It doesn't work together. What did I say? It doesn't work together. So the thing that, what I said about frugality is very important. This is part of the reason why in their wisdom, in the early church, in their wisdom, far back in centuries, that part of the discipline of the Catholic priest is poverty, obedience, and chastity. Because they go to the core of the human concupiscences. They go to the very core of human concupiscence. Every human being wants power, isn't it? And then the priest goes and takes a vow, a promise that I will obey whatever my bishop says. That's not easy for any human being. Pleasure. That one of the things that make human beings crazy. I read an article recently about um, you know what, the sec what sexual appetite has done to many, many powerful human beings. That many powerful human beings have been reduced to the dust by sexual appetite. The church knew it at the beginning and makes its priests to take the vow of chastity. Then, poverty. The desire to surround ourselves with so much. The church knew it, that these things will not allow the person to grow spiritually and makes us take the vow of willful poverty. I was speaking with a discussion with uh, uh, Father uh, Anthony Akewale, and he said, I am a vice chancellor of a university owned by my congregation. That means I don't get a salary. And I don't even have a car in my name. But I'm a vice chancellor. This is the Catholic discipline. Of course, there are one or two, there are here and there you see priests that violate it very badly. But generally, this is our discipline. I'm trying to tell you why did the church in its wisdom put that discipline? It is to check the human appetite for power, for pleasure, and for wealth. And all of us, and I'm saying, it's, don't see it as only those crazy people who want to be priests or want to be sisters. It is for all Christians. All Christians should be able to say, what do I need another car for? What do I need another house for? There are many poor children out there. Why do I need this extra gadget? All Christians, I insist, I'm one of those who say that 
we need to emphasize the fact that every Christian is a man of God, is a woman of God. And to emphasize the responsibility of every Christian and what go, the sacrifices that should go with the life of every Christian. The prophet is a man on a dangerous mission. Abibeko. The prophet is a man on, or a woman on a dangerous mission because his message is often rejected and his life will often be at risk. But the prophet is not to take any weapons to defend himself. It will be a terrible prophet, a misnomer actually, for a prophet to be carrying guns and whatever to defend himself. This is why, because it is such a dangerous mission, this is why no one on his own would choose to be a prophet. No one would choose to be a prophet. I mean, we have been baptized and anointed as priest, prophet, and king. I can't help it. I have been commissioned. But it's not as if on my own I would have chosen the life of a prophet. Because it is not easy. No one. When people go around and call themselves prophet, they don't know what they are talking about. Do you get my point? They don't know what they are talking about. Do you really desire the life of Jeremiah? You really think you desire the life of John the Baptist? No. Nobody. Nobody will choose to be a prophet unless you don't know what a prophet is. Sam, I mean, Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah so understood it that he busted out crying. You have seduced me, Lord, and I have allowed myself to be seduced. You are the stronger and I am the weaker. How, how, how did I let this happen? That's somebody who knows what the burden of a prophet is. But the Lord says, do not be dismayed at their presence, at the presence of those who will attack the word of God, the prophet of God. Or, if you are dismayed before them, I will make you dismayed. The Lord promises to make his prophet, what? A fortified city, a pillar of iron, a wall of bronze. The Lord supplies the graces necessary for his prophets. Amen? Amen. That is why the prophet has to be close to God. Because the prophet is not doing his own work. He's doing the work of the Lord. He says, they will fight against you, but shall not overcome you. For I am with you to do what? To deliver you. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 19. The prophet is a messenger of truth. Truth may suffer only temporary setbacks. Yet, both truth and the messenger of truth cannot be destroyed. Can we read that together? The truth may suffer only temporary setbacks. Yet, both truth and the messenger of truth cannot be destroyed. The mighty and the powerful of this world... Those who are benefiting from the status quo, and no matter how rotten things are, some people are benefiting, isn't it? I do say that those who make progress in the latrine are maggots, right? Aha. So no matter how rotten things are, there are creatures that benefit from the rottenness. Those who are living lives of falsehood, those who are presiding over unjust and evil systems, those who are living immoral, corrupt lives, they will often seek to silence truth. Right? And they will want to kill and banish the prophet who preaches truth so that their consciences may not be disturbed. Because each time they hear truth, the thing is affecting something inside. And they don't want. George Owell says what? The further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those that speak it. Again, the farther a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those. 
but no one can destroy the truth and the truth bearer. The Lord will take care of his prophet. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. 2 Corinthians 12, 19. My grace is sufficient for you. This is the assurance we have from him. Now, Jesus and the prophetic mission. In Jesus, the prophecies of Jeremiah, of Isaiah, of Baruch, of Daniel, of Zachariah, and others, and John the Baptist, all those prophecies find fulfillment. Jesus is the Messiah to whom all the major prophets point. Jesus is Jeremiah's what? Prophet over nations and kingdoms. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. Jesus is Isaiah's what? Wonderful counselor and prince of peace. Isaiah 9 6. Jesus is also Isaiah's suffering servant. Isaiah 53. Who will the, and he is John the Baptist's powerful one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Matthew 3, 11. After reading Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 2, the Spirit of the Lord has been given to me for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind, to make the lame walk, and to declare the Lord's year of favor. All eyes were fixed on Jesus, and he said, this prophecy is being fulfilled today even as you listen. Luke chapter 4 verse 21. There were three levels of reaction to Jesus' proclamation. There was no problem about reading the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor to declare the Lord's year of favor. That, there was no problem with reading that. What was the problem? This prophecy is being, was he reading when he said that? That was outside the text. This prophecy is being fulfilled today even as you listen. One, the first level was admiration, astonishment. They first spoke highly of Jesus. Say, see, see what gracious words come out of his mouth. The next level was questioning, doubt, suspicion. Is this not Joseph's son? The carpenter. We know him now. Ah, where did he get all this? Next, we don't know what's going on with him. What's wrong with him? We heard that you perform many miracles elsewhere. Why don't you perform such miracles here in your home? Does charity not begin at home? Three, the next level, rejection, condemnation, and even an attempt at Execution. The listeners in Nazareth were angered. They became hostile. Their admiration quickly changed to a murderous rage. They took him out of the city. And they meant to silence him forever. But Jesus slipped out of their midst. So Jesus came on a mission to do what? One, to set humanity free from sin and damnation. Two, to show the way to those who are lost. Three, to shed his powerful light into the darkness of the world and for to heal the broken hearted and give humanity abundant life. Yet, I mean, everything Jesus came for was positive, isn't it? And for whose benefit? Good. Yet, Jesus had to contend with what? Doubts and suspicions, the prejudices and presumptions, the gossip and character assassination of the local people. He was not immune to any of these. So if any of us suffers any of these, we are in good company. Instead, Jesus recognized that prophets are not accepted among their own people. The people of Nazareth complained that Jesus performed no miracles among them. They told him that charity should begin at home. But, you see, since it is... Um, Something qualifies people for miracles, not just because I am from there, like the way we do things in Nigeria. Right? They did not show faith. They showed disbelief in him, and so he could not work the miracles. But Jesus demonstrated to them that he was not part of their narrow nationalism. He refused to be part of the maddened crowd 
with their narrow tribal clannish idea of salvation. Uh, so because I came to save the world, I must begin from my family, even when my family does not believe. He says, no. And you know, this is what Jesus Christ has come to teach the world. This is what he has come to show us. So when we continue that kind of bigotry, clannish bigotry, tribal bigotry, then we are not being Christians. And unfortunately, this is how it is. Jesus showed them that God is always more than people's expectation. We can never know God fully. In fact, the greatest sin of the Pharisees and scribes is that they thought they knew the ways of God too much. And when he uses two classic examples from their history to tell them that his mission is universal, this is part of the, the reason why he gave those two examples. To teach them that his mission is universal. The stories of the widow of Zarephath and the Naaman the Syrian, when he told them that story, it enraged them. They turned against him. The people became enraged. The crowd of admirers quickly turned into a violent mob. So Jesus slipped away, and we are told he never returned to Nazareth again. He suffered the fate of all prophets. But why did his people reject him? In what ways did Jesus provoke them? One, they rejected him because he pointed out their lack of faith and they were not prepared to listen. Understood? I mean, look at Nigerian, Nigerians. Every Nigerian person says, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, we are Christian. We are very religious. And when we begin to punch holes in the so-called religiosity of people, when, as I said last Sunday, my friend said, oh, yeah, Nigerians are religious. Ah, Nigerians are religious, but what kind of religion? So this is a religion of power, profit, and pleasure. Do you think many Nigerians want to hear that? Say, no, no, I mean, it's a religion of Jesus Christ. Say, for where? Your religion is religion of power, profit, and pleasure. So you are only using God. You are only instrumentalizing the name of Jesus. And you want to twist the hand of God for you to get the power you want. I mean, if you see the campaigns that are going around these days, in every place they are singing choruses and calling the name of Jesus in the most, as far as I'm concerned, in the most re reckless manner. Every one of them are just using the name of Jesus anyhow and thinking that all the wuluru you are doing, that Jesus is with you, So, in all those campaigns, Jesus is just being used, instrumentalized. Because what they did before they sang that song, what they are going to do after singing that song. And you know, that is why it's so easy to take a Christian chorus and begin to use it to praise a governor or a senator or a president. Can you see what Nigerians do? You take a chorus that was composed in church to glorify God and Jesus, and the Christian tongue sits to begin to praise a governor, and Nigerians are singing it. So we can't even say, we can't reserve that song that we sing in church. Can't you think of another melody? It has to be that, kind, that song. You just change the name from Jesus to praising a governor. And it's, it's done, I'm saying, who, who does this? It's Christians who are doing it. That shows, for me, it just shows how sacred the name of Jesus really is for your heart. If you can take a song that we sing to glorify God and put somebody's name because you expect that person to give you money. So what are we doing with religion? What are we doing with the name of God? We are just using it as an instrument to get our power, to get our pleasure, to get our profit. That's all we are doing. So Jesus pointed out their lack of faith. He also spoke the truth which they did not want to hear. And what is the truth? That the Gentiles were more open to God than his own people were. You think they wanted to hear that? That as at the time of Elijah and Elisha, many Gentiles will come to obtain the benefit of salvation before them. You think they want to hear that? That there is no room for privileges in God's 
kingdom. That what group one belongs to does not matter. God's salvation is meant for all. The only condition is faith, as we read at the conversion of Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. Prophecy is not about pleasing people. It actually makes people uncomfortable. Only false prophets speak what people want to hear. I read yesterday evening that 1,000 clerics have adopted a particular party. How many of you saw it? 1,000 clerics have adopted a particular party and that whatever is like, these are chop-chop clerics. They say uh, 1,000 interfaith, not only Christians, interfaith clerics, we have uh, uh, adopted a particular candidate. I say these ones are chop-chop clerics. The true prophet often says what people do not want to hear. The truth of God will often hurt the hearers because people do not change easily. The truth of God should never be compromised. It should never be watered down to so that people will come. For example, so that, so that more people will come to look sterile. Let me water down the truth, God forbid. Because if you are following Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ did when he told the bitter truth and people went away, even the remaining, he asked them, are you sure you want to remain? You remember that? John chapter 6, verse 69. Are you sure you want to remain? You too can go. Because for Jesus, you can't water down the truth. The truth will, you know. Yet, God's truth must always be spoken in love. Love was the greatest motivation of Jesus Christ in his prophetic mission. So when people go around and say, look, if you do not, if you do not repent, you will die, you will burn in hell for, for fire in sulfur. Uh, there is a method to this. Love should be the greatest motivation of all who speak for God at all times. Love should be the driving force for all who live by Jesus' mission. Or mission statement of freeing captives, healing the brokenhearted, opening the eyes of the blind, preaching the good news to the poor, and declaring the Lord's year of favor. Those who speak for God should live like God in love. The prophet must carry out God's command in love. Even in the face of hostility, there should be what? No bitterness, no thought of revenge, no brooding over injury. The best example, one of the best examples we have in this is Martin Luther King Jr. So if you read about the life of Martin Luther King Jr., with all the pressures that were on him to want revenge, instead, prophets should re rejoice in truth, bearing and enduring all things. Love is the prophet's source of energy. The source of energy of the prophet. What makes the prophet endure? is love. Love is the driving force for all who speak for God. If there is no love in your heart and you say you are speaking the truth, what happens is that you are not speaking for God. Right? You may be speaking, saying what is supposed to be truth, but if you are saying it without love, then you are not saying it in God's name. And what it often leads to, it often leads to frustration and burnout and so on and so forth. We all as Christians have a prophetic calling, baptized as prophets, priests, and kings. It is part of our calling, therefore, to listen to God's word and witness to it with our very lives. To speak for God in all circumstances. To shine God's light through the darkness of our society. To speak God's truth in an environment of falsehood. To be the conscience of our society. Denouncing sin and immorality in all its manifestations, condemning social justice, oppressive customs, corruption, ethnic bigotry, male chauvinism, etc. To be the voice of the voiceless in society, defending the poor and speaking truth to power. You see how Moses went to speak to Pharaoh like a prophet. God calls Moses to go and confront Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 12. Isaiah says, Go and say to the people, Hear and hear again, but do not understand. See and see again, but do not perceive. Do you think that was an easy message to say? 
Isaiah 6, 1 to 10. Then prophet Jeremiah was called to go to those people as we have heard. Amos said, the lion roars. Who can help feeling afraid? The Lord Yahweh speaks. Who can refuse to prophesy? Amos chapter 3 verse 1 to 8. Matthew 10, 16, Jesus says, Behold, I am sending you as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Let me end with my poem I call Truth. Truth is inviolable. Truth is inviolable. Immortal truth is indomitable. As often as truth is crucified, so often shall it rise again. Persecutors of truth always end up being confounded and humiliated by the obstinacy of truth. Truth is a child of freedom. And it remains free in spite of the presumptions, of all presumptions, to cage or imprison it. Truth is inflammable. Truth is highly combustible. Those who attempt to seal or suppress truth often discover in truth a potent explosive which is less dangerous when exposed and contended with than when sealed up or set aside. Like truth, the truth bearer, that is the prophet, is a child of freedom. And he, always, he shall always remain free in spite of all the efforts of the enemies of truth to use all the instrument of coercion to imprison, to proscribe or silence him. As long as he stands on the side of truth, the truth bearer shall remain free. And all attempts to tarnish, to malign, to discredit the truth bearer will boomerang. For truth shall bounce back with a vengeance. Thus, as we cannot build our lives on, on that's lies, on lies and falsehood, truth must be told. In season and out of season, truth must be told. As our land will not survive on deceit and delusion, truth must be told. Welcome or unwelcome, truth must be told. Since peace cannot reign atop a pack of cards, truth must be told. However offensive to the status quo, truth must be told. Since the reign of falsehood is as perennial as the grass, truth must be told. No matter how embarrassing, truth must be told. Indeed, truth must be told. Whatever the pretensions of falsehood, truth must be told. For truth alone stands the test of time. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we glorify your holy name for your many blessings. Thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the prophets. Thank you that Jesus Christ died for the truth and has shown us how to stand on the side of truth. That Jesus Christ has demonstrated to us with his very life, his death and resurrection, that truth crucified will rise again. Help each one of us to recognize that truth crucified will rise again. Help us to pitch our tent with truth. To live out truth, to live truth in our hearts and to live it out in our society. Lord, in the midst of rottenness and moral degeneration in our society, help us to be men and women of truth. <laughs> help us the, to face the truth of our Christian calling and live it out by your grace to your glory and for the betterment of humanity through Christ our Lord. Amen.